Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my children had a, uh, uh, an elementary school teacher uh, here in Seattle, and uh, he uh, brought his harmonica each morning, and as soon as he played it, he was first, first grade teacher, as soon as he played it, every, all the kids just quieted down. And then he pretended about three weeks into the school year uh, to have forgotten his harmonica. And so he decided to turn each section of the class into a different tone. And so he had mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and he had all the kids becoming a human harmonica. And uh, I asked him, oh, why, where did he, how did he do, come up with such a brilliant idea? And he said, when you're humming, you cannot talk. <laughs> I am delighted to be back at the Hearthstone. So thank you so much for having me. We've got a lot of ground to cover, and I want to leave plenty of, of time for Q&A, uh, because you, if, um, history be our guide, and it often is. You always ask such good questions, uh, stumpers in some cases that I think about on my way home and think, well, maybe I should have answered it this way or that. But um, you have a well-informed and well-read and well-traveled community at the Hearthstone, uh, and it is much appreciated. It makes uh, teaching a, a breeze, frankly. So thanks for that. Thanks to Pedro and Kristen and Steve for all of you, uh, all of your technical and, and programmatic support. We're going to cover a lot of territory. We're going to talk about two countries that are right across the Gulf from each other, but also oftentimes worlds apart for all kinds of reasons. They've been in the news. They will be in the news. Uh, and interestingly, one of them, uh, one of these polities, as they say in social sciences, one of these political organizations has existed for almost 2,500 years. The other for less than 100 years. So think about all of these things that uh, as we march through the history of this part of the world. As you think of good questions, uh, store them away. We'll get to them as quickly as we can, but I'm not going to uh, uh, waste any time here at the beginning. We are looking at the Middle East uh, today, uh, important parts of it. Iran and Saudi Arabia, we'll zero in on them. There are lots of other ripple effects that those con two countries have had in the region for a long time. The body of water that gives its name to this region of the Middle East is, is called the Persian Gulf by the Iranians and the Arabian Gulf by the Arabs. And um, as you can see, there are uh, a complete surrounding of the, of the territory, uh, mostly by the two 800-pound camels in, in the region, Iran to the north and Saudi Arabia to the south. As you may remember from an earlier conversation that we've had, I, my wife and I lived in Oman uh, for six years of our professional lives and uh, had a wonderful opportunity to not only get to know the region and get to know the people, but also to look at our neighbors, uh, Saudi Arabia on one side of us and Iran to the north, and uh, try to understand what their reason for being was and what would explain their diplomatic and foreign policy uh, activities and goals. And so hopefully I have a lot of good local knowledge of this region. We're going to cover a lot of territory. Thank you. I think I've already done that. And then we're going to have, uh, by popular demand, I must say, a little bit of a language lesson. So uh, get ready to um, wet your chops a little bit. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran have vastly different histories as, as countries. We're going to look at the Sunni-Shia split, uh, again, a, a topic that we could have spent all day on today. Uh, but we'll, we'll uh, 
range over the chief differences between the Sunnis in the Arab world in this part of the, of the Middle East and the Shia, primarily in Iran, but also in other countries around the Gulf. We'll look at the leadership in both countries and what's coming and what, uh, what uh, uh, the leadership has looked like. You can imagine now that we already, uh, it's noon and you're, and you're hungry and we've, uh, we've gone too far, but bless their hearts, they decide uh, just a couple of months ago uh, to bury the hatchet, as it were, and come back into each other's diplomatic spheres uh, uh, in ways that they had not been in eight years. What does this all mean for the U.S. and our foreign policy? And then, as you also may remember, I can't help but have a benediction at the end of my uh, talks. Uh, and, in, and today, you are doubly blessed uh, with two benedictions. So um, I'll try to keep them both short. Iran on the left, uh, the, the symbols of the two countries are uh, in some ways similar but in some ways quite different. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has two crossed uh, uh, curved swords on it and a palm tree, and uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran's uh, national symbol is actually the word Allah written in calligraphy script. And so, if I do nothing else today, I'd like you all to go away knowing how to pronounce these two countries' names. Uh, it, it drives me to distraction that these two countries are each just two syllables, and most Americans mispronounce both of them. <laughs> so, if you would repeat after me, Ir, Ir. Ron, Ron. Iran. Iran. Iran, Iran. Now, good, Ir, Rock, Iraq, Iraq. Okay, so your job, not being the human harmonicus right now, but your job during the Q&A Q is if somebody says Iran or Iraq, uh, your job is to chime in and say Iran, Iraq. Okay, well, I love interactivity. <laughs> Kingdom of, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was formed in 1932 by the father of the current king. Uh, his name is uh, Salman ibn Abdulaziz al Saud, and uh, he uh, took power in 2016 at the death of, uh, of King Abdullah, his half brother. We all know that standing right behind King Salman is one of his sons, not his eldest son, mind you, but his favorite son, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, often referred to as MBS. On the Iranian side, there are, uh, uh, and we'll talk about this if we have time, there is a kind of a peculiar marriage of both theocracy and democracy in Iran. And so there is this supreme leader who is himself a religious figure or an ayatollah, which in Persian and Arabic means sign of God. Uh, and he runs the show. And there is a much less powerful position of the president, which, who is popularly elected, in fact, uh, and he, his job is mostly administrative and implements the decisions of the Ayatollah, who, who is at the top of the, uh, of the government food chain. There have only been two Ayatollahs in charge of Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini in 1979 when he took power from the Shah of Iran, and his, his successor, Khamenei, who took power in 1989 and has been in charge ever since. Also in the news, and uh, an opportunity to learn a little bit of Kurdish, not just Persian or, uh, or Arabic, is, as you all know, this popular movement by mostly girls and women, joined in some cases by men and boys as well, uh, uh, that, that uh, sprung from the death in custody by a young woman named Mahsa Amini, who died at age 22 for not wearing her hijab correctly. 
So if uh, in, uh, in Kurdish, which is where the Kurdistan part of Iran, where Masa Amani came from, uh, the words woman, life, and freedom have become the rallying call and the rallying cry for this movement in the, across Iran. So if you would repeat after me, Jin, Jian, Azadi, Jin, Jian, Azadi. You'll fit right in in Tehran when you go. Iran is an extraordinary uh, country topographically as well as historically, politically, the theologically. But when one of the, the curious things about Iran is that it is absolutely, uh, it, to, the, to land forces, almost impenetrable. It didn't mean that Alexander the Great 2,400 years ago didn't, uh, didn't conquer them, and it didn't mean that they didn't uh, convert sort of en masse to, uh, to uh, Islam in the 8th century, 7th century. Uh, but look at the way the topography of the country is so different from every other part of the Gulf. The, every other part of the Gulf you can see as far as the eye allows you to, but uh, Iran is definitely uh, a mountainous region with a very high plateau here uh, where uh, the vast majority of their population lives. As I mentioned, it's an ancient civilization. They have, their history is sort of broken down into these three groups. There's ancient Persia, there's medieval and, and early Islamic uh, Persia, and then the modern period. But for 2,500 years, uh, they have been a, a political force in the region, a military force, a religious force. And interestingly, somebody said, well, um, 2,500 years, that's exactly 10 times the age of the United States. So think about the historical, um, what's the right word? Momentum and sometimes baggage that comes with coming from a civilization that has that deep a set of roots. They have uh, themselves been an empire over time, uh, including uh, in ran uh, the show for hundreds of years under different uh, empires in the region. The Achaemenid Empire under Cyrus the Great, there he is, uh, was probably the best known of these. Cyrus the Great uh, uh, ruled in the fifth century before the Common Era. And uh, it was also the birthplace of Zoroastrianism. That's going to become significant in our time today because so much of that early monotheistic religion was incorporated into Islam as they converted a thousand years later. So, uh, in fact, some Arabs around the world refer to uh, the Persians not as Arabs or as Shia uh, or as Persians, but as Zoroastrians. There were different empires that, that grew and shrank uh, over time uh, with uh, the, the power uh, in Persia at its core. As I mentioned, in the seventh century, when the prophet Muhammad died in 632 of the Common Era, uh, Islam spread like wildfire all the way to the Himalayas in the east and to uh, southern France in the west. One, I picked this map on purpose because it's really a, uh, an, a revealing map about how closely Iran and Iraq are uh, related to each other. So when you think about these different empires that you've just seen, look where Baghdad is. Use the laser pointer. Yes, I'll use the laser pointer. <laughs> it's tiny. Uh, there's Baghdad, uh, the Iraqi capital, in the middle of Iran, and so much so over the years that Iraq was often referred to as the Persian Iraq, not just Iraq. And so that uh, swath of Shiism, that uh, branch of, of Islam, um, included much of, of today's regions where Iran is still sending its tentacles uh, to help control that region. 
The British called these, these empires the gunpowder empires, uh, the Mughals in India, the Persians in the Safavid Empire, and the Ottomans to the west. The irony being, of course, that no uh, empire used gunpowder more than the British. <laughs> yeah. Quickly, uh, in and interestingly, there are about 80 million people in Iran today, and that number of people is equal to the number of all the other peoples around the Gulf. So it's a, a single country, but has as many people as Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and Qatar and the Emirates and Saudi Arabia uh, and Oman have together. They have been the, the uh, destination for millions of Afghan refugees since the 1979 invasion by the Soviet Union of Afghanistan. Per capita income is much lower than the rest of the Gulf, where there is more uh, oil and more, uh, more wealth and smaller populations, but still considerable. Iran is almost all Shiite or Shia uh, Muslim, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Life expectancy has skyrocketed since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. There's a, a figure, a statistic that you may not uh, have been familiar with, but there is a long tradition of women and girls having educational opportunities in Iran. Another statistic that you may not have been familiar with is the vast youth bulge. And that youth bulge is one of the things that is propelling and uh, maybe even fueling the uh, street demonstrations. And then the last one on this quick uh, uh, factoid sheet is how much of a brain drain has gone on in Iran since 1979? Think about if 30% of our uh, holders of a bachelor's degree or, or a master's degree had left the country to work somewhere else. It means that there is a very considerable diaspora of Iranians around the world, including here in Seattle. In the beginning of the 16th century of the Common Era, the, the Shah of this uh, empire decided that he'd had enough of being a second-class citizen. So he said to the rest of the, of the uh, Muslim world, you can have your Sunni Islam. I'm going to take this little minority group, and we're going to make it part of our identity. And so by fiat, in the beginning of the 16th century, the Shah Ismail I uh, decided that they would become a Shiite uh, entity as a country. So the vast majority, you've seen this before if you, we've talked about Islam, um, the vast majority of Muslims around the world are Sunni, and we'll see what that means in just a second, with about one-seventh of that number uh, consider themselves Shiite. But even though there's that seven to one uh, imbalance in the Middle East itself, the, around the Persian Gulf, use your pointer, around here, there is an almost 50-50 balance. And so it isn't that one is uh, the poor uh, cousin uh, at the table, but uh, pretty much an equal member. Well, this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, not, I didn't make it, I borrowed it. Borrowed it. Uh, and it's a little bit like the periodic table. Uh, when you first see it, you go, oh my golly, <laughs> that's awful. Uh, but then the more you look at it, the more you get to know it. And, um, and this is one of those things. This is the Prophet Muhammad over here, and this is a roughly uh, historical development within Islam. The Prophet Muhammad dies, as I mentioned, in 632. He is succeeded, the word khalifa or caliph simply means successor in Arabic. He is succeeded by four guys, three here and then one here. And that's where in the seventh century the split between Sunni and Shia happened. Shiite is a, is a shortened version of Shiite Ali, the party of Ali. And so Shiites believe that the leader of the Muslim community must be someone in the prophet's bloodline, whereas Sunnis think it can be any righteous male. 
So every Shiite leader either is or claims to be a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, whereas virtually nobody on the Sunni side suggests that. What's, what this means is that there aren't so large a set of theological differences between these two sects of Islam, but there are tremendous political differences. And more recently, uh, and one of the books on your resource list goes into this at great depth, um, the uh, strong men around the region in Arab and Persian countries have used the divisions of, uh, within Islam as a wedge to drive between people. What also this slide tells you is that once you've sort of satisfied yourself that you're either a Sunni or a Shiite, then the fun really begins as you start branching off into every possible permutation of interpretation of the Quran uh, that you can imagine. And it may be human nature. This uh, branching of uh, from the common root probably reminds you of something. And... <laughs> But one of the interesting things about uh, those branchings is that they're often geographically uh, determined if, or influenced, let's say. So the Hanbali uh, and their most strict sub-branch, the Wahhabis that you've heard about, are almost all in Saudi Arabia. And uh, King Saud and the Wahhabis uh, entered into a kind of a diplomatic pact to share power. Yes. Yes, yes, I will do, thank you. Um, these are different delineations of parts of the Islamic world as it relates to interpretation. And uh, there are more strict and less strict. One of the prime examples that has to do with Mahsa Amini and her death in the hands of the, uh, the uh, trying to think of what we call them in English, the, the the guidance of morality squad. Uh, that, that in the Quran itself, it says to both men and women, dress modestly. It says it three times, but that's the only instruction it gives about dress in the Quran. So different people in Afghanistan, in Seattle, in uh, Kuala Lumpur will define that differently according to their own interpretation and cultural backgrounds. Importantly, uh, oil, of course, plays a vast, uh, uh, maybe an over outsized uh, influence in all of the countries of the Persian Gulf. Uh, it was pretty well known among geologists that this, in fact, is these red swatches are, uh, show where the oil is in this part of the world. And it was a Briton at the beginning of the 20th century named William Knox Darcy that bought from the rather corrupt, the way corrupt Shah of Iran, uh, Shah of Persia, he bought a concession from him for 20,000 pounds that did two things. It gave William Knox Dar oops, Darcy uh, access to Iran's oil, three things it did. It gave him that access for 60 years, and it gave him the formula that they relied on right up until the 1960s, which was the Britons get six pieces of gold and the Persians get one. So the 16% rule um, uh, played out throughout the 20th century. They found oil in southwestern Iran in 1908, right there. This is a map of Iran with the uh, place where, uh, where oil was first discovered. And the motto back then was, one for us and six for the Britons. This did not go over well with everyone in Iran. Iran has a tremendous amount of oil, but even more natural gas. 
the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, which was what William Knox Darcy started, uh, uh, it continued throughout most of the 20th century to, to reap the b vast majority of the profits. Interestingly, Iran shares its large natural gas field with Qatar across the Gulf. And so they, since uh, the 19, late 1950s, they've been sharing this natural gas resource. State owns all of these resources, and Iran was a founding member of OPEC. That was uh, one of the earliest uh, examples of how Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, cooperated over trying to maintain a high, but not overly high, price for oil. Uh, does anybody know what the four founding members of OPEC, what those were? Iran, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Venezuela. Yeah, go figure, huh? The Anglo-Persian oil company becomes, over time, when Iran, under the first Shah of Iran in the 20th century, uh, changes the name of the country from Persia, which was the Greek name, to Iran, which is what they call themselves. Uh, he changed it to the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, and we know that company today as British Petroleum. British Petroleum decided that the old corrupt Shah wasn't quite uh, malleable enough, so they installed I can use, oh, I can use my outdoor voice. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. So in 1925, uh, they found uh, a man who was in the army, a Cossack, a member of the Persian Cossack Brigade, and they talked him into uh, a coup d'etat where he overthrew the Shah of Iran and placed himself on what he uh, fashioned as the peacock throne a hearkening back to Cyrus the, the Great uh, 2,500 years earlier. Reza Shah Pahlavi uh, was a, a, a strong man uh, and uh, came from a military background and did many things that uh, would lead eventually to his son's downfall. And one of those things was to marginalize the clerical establishment. The clerical establishment had been an important political uh, force in Iran, even under all of those shahs and, and uh, Parsis. Uh, but uh, the, the shah, Reza Shah, decided that they had too much power, so he's going to push them to the side. Reza Shah loved other strong men. They just got along so well together. This is a picture of uh, Mustafa Kemal uh, Ataturk. We could talk about Turkey all day too, but we're not going to. Uh, but uh, Reza Shah had a, uh, just thought Mussolini was the cat's pajamas. And uh, he, it went so far that Reza Shah fell into a kind of a bromance with um, Adolf Hitler, at which point the British and the Americans and the French and the Russians say, he's got to go. <laughs> and so they manufactured a, uh, a deposing uh, force that pushed the old Shah out of power and installed in his place the 21-year-old son uh, that we know today as the Shah of Iran. So the first thing the British did, uh, with uh, some American help, was install the old Shah in 1925, and then deposed him, installed their son, his son, and then uh, in the late uh, 1940s and early 1950s, there was a real democratization movement all around the world, in fact. So empires were falling apart, no, and this one was, uh, was no exception. And uh, a parliament uh, that had been empowered in 1906 during a, a similar movement of democrat democratization uh, elected as their leader, the prime minister, a man named Mohammed Mozadegh. And Mohammed Mozadegh said, oh, uh, you know, this, this oil that's under our land really should belong to us. 
And so he nationalized the Iranian oil company and taking not one out of six pieces of gold, but took the whole bag of gold to uh, belong to Iran. The British and the Americans didn't find that to be acceptable, and so they organized another coup, and they had Mossadegh deposed, put into a home uh, uh, house arrest where he lived for 14 years, and reinstalled the man we know of as the Shah of Iran. So if you have an interest in 1953 coup, uh, that was manufactured on the American side by Kermit Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's grandson. It's a fascinating story. The Shah was b wildly unpopular uh, among the, the vast majority of people in Iran. Uh, he, uh, uh, he led with an iron fist. He was extremely lavish in his lifestyle. He modernized from above. Uh, he also implemented a group called Savak. Savak were the, the secret police force in Iran under the Shah, and it was estimated that one in 20 Iranian citizens worked for Savak. We loved him because he was keeping the oil spill spigots going, and he was also buying a tremendous amount of, of uh, weaponry from the United States and from Great Britain. And he, like his father, pushed the clerical establishment off to the side. The clerical establishment, again, didn't really like that, and they felt that they represented a much more hmm, indigenous form of being Persian than this uh, Shah that was imposed by outside powers on the people of Iran. The Shah managed to offend the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was in uh, first Iraq and then in Paris, uh, continuing to foment revolution back in Iran. Now we're talking about the late 1970s. The Ayatollah and his uh, religious brethren uh, were actively uh, opposed to the Shah. The small d democratic and left wing and labor organizers were opposed to the Shah. And then the Shah lost the bazaris, as we say in Persian, the, the men and women who worked in the, uh, the marketplace writ large. Uh, and they too were offended by the Shah bringing in all of these cheap Western goods and putting them out of business. And the last group that he alienated were people on the periphery. There's a long history in Iran of the periphery and the center being at odds with each other. The Shah seems just to have forgotten everybody else. But what he managed to do, that means, is alienate everybody. At this point, the Ayatollah comes back from exile, uh, lands in Tehran, and it's as though the second coming had happened. Millions of people greeted him at the airport and in downtown Tehran, and it was only a matter of time before the Shah fled yet again and uh, left the country first to Egypt and maybe uh, ostensibly at least on for health purposes. And then when uh, the United States under Jimmy Carter admitted the Shah for more medical treatment, that's when the U.S. Embassy was seized in Tehran. That happened um, while we were, my wife and I, were in Oman across the, uh, across the Gulf, and it was a fraught time, as we all remember, that it was a very emotional time to see those uh, men and women of our embassy being held for more than a year by these radicals uh, in, uh, in Tehran. One of them, John Limbert, uh, pictured on the right in the blindfold, uh, went on to become a, a very thoughtful bridge builder with Iran. He didn't uh, hold a grudge against them. He tried to think of ways that the United States and Iran could get back into each other's good graces or at least talking to each other. He's written a book about his ordeal in the, uh, in the embassy uh, and as a captive. And he, one of the things he mentions is that 
uh, a half an hour every week, they were allowed uh, to watch one American television show. And it was said to be the Ayatollah's favorite TV show. And it was Gilligan's Island. Um, Limbert says in his book, it was the only time they were subjected to psychological terror and <laughs> torture. As I mentioned, um, uh, the, the, the theologians are at the top of the, of the pyramid in making decisions in Iran. And I, as I also mentioned, there are 70% of the country are out there under the age of 30. So if you just these next two slides, if, if you remember Iran and Iraq, these next two slides will tell you so much about Iran today. This is what the leadership looks like. This is what the people look like. Well, let me do that again. Th these guys look like me, only really older, even, if, if that's possible. And these young people have just the desires and fervor and, and aspirations for a life not constrained by uh, old geezers. If we had more time, we'd talk about the, uh, the, the way the curious way that the Islamic uh, Republic is both Islamic and a republic. We'll, but we'll, that's stuff for another, uh, another gathering. One of the things I also always do is talk about what Freedom House makes of this or that country around the world. And out of a score of 100, they, uh, every year, they look at the different scores of countries on the, in terms of their civil rights and individual liberties. So you're probably not surprised that Norway scores so high on this list. Uh, what do you think the United States scores? Well, 83. Yeah, we're doing pretty well, but we've still got some uh, distance to go to make a more perfect union. Uh, what do you think Iran is? Yeah, and sadly, Iran's going backwards. I wonder if I included the following year. Yeah, and this year. So they're going downhill toward a much less free, much less um, civil society. Now, quickly, over to uh, Saudi Arabia. King Salman, Mohammed bin Salman, running the show. Uh, King Salman, as I mentioned, was one of the sons of Ibn Saud, the founder of, of Saudi Arabia. Uh, I, too, looked at their Freedom House ranking. Remember, Iran is uh, 14, Norway is 100, we're at 83. What do you think Saudi Arabia is? Our chief ally in the region uh, has a, uh, a score uh, that's pretty close to North Korea's, which is three. Interestingly, in Saudi Arabia, they had a lineal uh, succession, meaning that the king, when he died, his son, first son, uh, Saud, uh, on the far left of this slide, he took power. But, um, but interestingly, ever since 1953, when Ibn Saud died, it's only been his sons who have been in charge of the country. No grandsons, no great-grandsons, yet. They started as a small tribe in the very center of, of Saudi Arabia and then by uh, conquest of other Bedouin tribes and intermarrying with their daughters meant that he pretty soon made a country that was almost exclusively in some way related to him by either blood or marriage. They too found oil uh, in this case, the, the concession was granted to five American oil companies, all uh, offspring of Standard Oil, and they paid a good deal more for this concession, but the, the area the size of their concession was the size of California and had no end date to it. And as you probably all know, Saudi Aramco is still operating in this territory. They found oil about 30 years after Iran did, and uh, we 
as a, uh, as a country, particularly at the end of the Second World War, we really wanted to secure a dependable, reliable source of oil uh, for our industry and for our military. So at the end of uh, their summit at Yalta in 1945, FDR made a visit to, uh, a, to meet with Ibn Saud, the Saudi king, and the two of them met on board a US ship uh, that, was, uh, that was docked in, the, in the, the Suez Canal. And at that point, in 1945, FDR says, if you provide us with a dependable, reliable, affordable source of oil in perpetuity, we will provide you with security in perpetuity. And that relationship to this day exists. Churchill wanted in on the, the, and if we had lots more time, I'd tell you some great stories about how Winston Churchill offended uh, Ibn Saud at virtually every turn. Uh, he, uh, Churchill insisted on having wine with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, at, at smoking a cigar all the time, at having women, wor women working on his, in his entourage, uh, and the British still don't have a, um, a foothold on any part of Saudi soil. Ibn Saud dies in 53. And then the, the sort of fun begins because he had, with all those intermarriages, 45 sons. Yes, and this is, they couldn't fit all in one picture. So um, the first one, use your pointer, Saud, uh, who was not a very capable young man, uh, and he succeeded his father, and ever since then, some one of his brothers or half-brothers has done so all the way up to today, but there have been just these seven uh, leaders of Saudi Arabia since 1932. King Salman is 83 and uh, is uh, reportedly in ill health. And uh, when he became uh, king uh, in the mid-teens of this uh, century, he set in motion a succession uh, group. The first one was this one where a half-brother named Mukrin was going to be the crown prince. And for the first time, a new member of the next generation, this man's name is Mohammed bin Nayef, uh, he was put in line to succeed uh, Salman. Mohammed bin Nayef, uh, interestingly, was the favorite of the Western powers that had been, and oil companies that had been dealing with Saudi Arabia for so long. Mohammed uh, bin Nayef went to Lewis and Clark College. I went to Lewis and Clark College. So did Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> uh, quickly, uh, Salman uh, uh, pushes out Mokrin and uh, uh, leaves Mohammed bin Nayef as crown prince, but then brings in, for the first time, Mohammed bin Salman, one of Salman's sons. And then, uh, and then Mohammed bin Nayef is pushed out, so there's only one crown prince now, uh, and it is Mohammed bin Salman. You may remember all of these uh, photographs from the news when Mohammed bin Salman came to the United States in 2018, and um, promised to buy this and that uh, bit of weaponry from us. And then you'll also remember this sort of famous fist bump that took place a year or so ago uh, in Riyadh when uh, President Biden visited. Mohammed bin Salman is known for many things, but uh, one of them is that he's ambitious. One of them is that he is um, vicious. And one of them is that he really does have a vision for where Saudi Arabia should be going in the future. He owns a da Vinci, he owns a yacht, he owns a villa in, Par in outside of Paris, uh, and he was um, instrumental in making the first overseas trip of President Trump a trip to Saudi Arabia. And so you also may remember this sort of odd moment when they're holding on to this orb. This man here is, uh, is Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the, the dictator of, of Egypt, King Salman, and then the Trumps. 
Uh, everywhere President Trump went, uh, Mohammed bin Salman had his face projected onto buildings all the way through the city of Riyadh. And then there's this quote that I just loved. Saudi Arabia, I get along with all of them. They buy apartments from me. They spend 40 million, 50 million dollars. Am I supposed to dislike them? I like them very much. I'll let you decide. Uh, I'd like you to decide who said that. Um, I don't know why I put this slide in, but we don't have time to talk about it. On your, on your uh, resource list is this marvelous uh, book edited by these two guys, uh, Danny Pastel and Nader Hashemi, all about the Sunni-Shia split. It's very readable. They look at each of the different countries, and it's a, f it's a phenomenal read for lay people like we are, as we are. Uh, you saw from the Freedom House ranking that Saudi Arabia scores very badly. One of the reasons is that Mohammed bin Salman is thin-skinned. He brooks no criticism. Uh, and when articles like this appeared in the Washington Post, uh, it got him even more and more and more riled up. Uh, you will not be surprised who wrote this article. It says Jamal Khashoggi down at the bottom. Uh, Khashoggi, as you, we all know, was, uh, was uh, kidnapped and, and murdered and dismembered uh, in a Saudi consulate in Istanbul in 2018, one of the real tragedies. It made me think about what kind of man uh, Mohammed bin Salman is, and uh, as I saw this short clip, uh, it reminded me that he may be very much more like Putin than he is like us. Quickly, you also may remember that we've been trying to get back into some kind of a relationship with Iran for all the years, 50-some now, since the Islamic Revolution and the uh, seizure of our embassy. Uh, you also will remember that President Reagan had this notion that if he could secretly sell missiles to the Iranians while we are publicly selling missiles to the Iraqis, and they're fighting each other uh, in the early years, all the years of the Reagan uh, term, uh, he thought he could then take the money that the Iranians would pay him under the table and use it to support the Contras, the uh, guerrillas that were trying to overthrow the Sandinista regime in Nicaragua. And these are the weapons that we sold to, um, to Iran, tow missiles, T-O-W, and then Congress got wind of this illegal scheme and had all sorts of uh, hearings on it that were televised and were riveting television to watch. You may remember Oliver North uh, in his crisp uh, uniform with a very devoted wife always behind him. And uh, he, in some ways, charmed America because he was so earnest and so um, straightforward and so uh, handsome in his uniform, but it led Daniel Shore on NPR to say, remember, magnetic north is not true north. <laughs> Years later, we try to get back into some kind of a dialogue with Iran, and we get all of the major powers around the, the, the world to agree on the Iran nuclear deal. This was a coup uh, in diplomatic terms. To get the Chinese and the Russians and the Germans and the French and the British and the Americans and the Iranians all on the same page to guarantee this deal that Iran would reduce its nuclear weapon uh, research was an absolute coup d'etat. But, as you also remember, uh, the United States unilaterally withdrew from that uh, that agreement in 2018 and imposed uh, a series of very uh, uh, strict sanctions on Iran and secondary sanctions on anybody that would do business with anybody doing business with Iran. People have asked me, why did Trump leave the Iran nuclear deal? And I think there are four pictures that will explain it to you. The first one was, it was something that Obama did. Got to, got to leave it. 
Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel hated this deal because it looked like we were starting to have uh, diplomatic relationships and normalizing that relationship with the, the uh, uh, enemy, the chief enemy of, of Israel. King Salman didn't like the deal, neither did his son Mohammed bin Salman, uh, because they felt that they were being uh, sidelined with Iran getting most of our attention. And finally, these two guys didn't like the deal. And they had uh, the inside ear of President Trump during his, his term. I talked about the sanctions. It, it was precipitous what happened when the sanctions were reimposed right here. Uh, the uh, impact on the, on the uh, Iranian economy was absolutely devastating and still is. Yet, the powers that be are still the powers that be in Tehran. Uh, Ayatollah Khamenei is uh, very conservative and very keen, maybe as much as the Saudi royal family is, of staying in power. And so he has this group called uh, the Morality Police. Let's see if I have them there. I don't, but this is when they came to hear him talk, this is what uh, the Ayatollah said to this group of people that had just been uh, uh, accused of, rightfully, of uh, violence against people in the streets and in particular of uh, women who don't conform to their uh, idea of dress. But he referred to this group of Basijis, it's a kind of a paramilitary organization that imposes uh, the morality on the people of Iran. He called them the greatest hope of the Iranian nation. Nothing could alienate him further from the average person in the street than to side with the people who are clubbing young women. We also have seen very recently that Iran has been providing uh, Russia with, uh, with weaponry, uh, drones in particular, that they are using in uh, Russia's uh, criminal war against Ukraine. And just a couple months ago, Saudi Arabia and Iran get back together again. Uh, the Omanis helped uh, broker this deal. The Iraqis helped broker this deal. But then they needed a superpower who could come in that was still talking to both sides, Iran and Saudi Arabia, and that's where China comes in, almost at the 11th hour. It doesn't mean that Iran and, and Saudi Arabia haven't had partnerships in the past. They certainly did when they helped form OPEC. Uh, a picture of the Iranian delegate at OPEC, a picture of the young Shah and King Saud on the top. But most recently, it was that Chinese foreign minister bringing the foreign ministers of Iran and, Sa and Saudi Arabia together uh, in this deal that is a comprehensive deal, economic, uh, trade, culture, military, all sorts of things. From the Iranian perspective, and this next uh, uh, map is from an Iranian English language textbook. You think about the history of the United States in the 20th century, 21st century, uh, we invaded Afghanistan in 20, uh, 2001 after the 9-11 the attacks. We invaded Iraq in 2003, and uh, Iran felt absolutely um, surrounded by hostile forces. And for good reason. We have a tremendous number of troops and, and sailors in, uh, in the Persian Gulf. The Fifth Fleet is based here in uh, Bahrain, Naval Support Activity Bahrain, and Com CENTCOM, one of our main defense uh, hubs, is in Qatar. Every book on your resource list is a good one to read, but there are also a whole bunch of links where you can just click on them, uh, Google search the title, and you'll be able to find a YouTube video of some extraordinarily thoughtful um, discussions about Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, all on your resource list. 
So the question now for you is, we have a few minutes, is, is this a new era? Is there a, a strategic realignment in the Middle East where uh, countries are relying less and less on the United States to provide security and branching out and trying to make relationships with China, with Russia, with each other internally in the region to guard their own security? And again, remember, in both cases for Iran and Saudi Arabia, it's security of the Saudi royal family and it's security for the Ayatollah that they are most concerned with. And now it's your turn to ask good questions and make comments. We did it all in less than an hour. Okay, so hands, please. I, my, I'm going uh, to, uh, the, the youth horse, I'm going to bet on the youth of Iran. They're well-educated, they're connected. The uh, Ayatollah has tried to clamp down on the internet in Iran, and the kids know how to get around that. And so they're all using virtual private networks, and uh, they are uh, connected to the rest of the world. So they know what's happening in downtown Los Angeles as well as in Riyadh or Beirut or Cairo. So I'm thinking that the youth are unstoppable there, but I don't have a timeline in mind. It could take a while. Yes, sir. I don't think so. It's a, it's a, uh, yeah, has the regime figured out a way to gracefully depart uh, and sort of keep the, f the form and function of the state, the regime itself, in place? And I think the answer is no for one real uh, uh, immediate reason, and that is that when, um, when the United States overthrew Mohammed Mossadegh in 1953 with Britain, uh, we imposed the Shah, but he had absolutely no legitimacy in the mind of the Iranian people. It was only a matter of time, though it was 26 years, before the Shah was deposed. Similarly, the uh, turning your guns on schoolgirls on the streets of Tehran or Isfahan or Qum is, uh, was a rapid way of losing the people's sense that you are a legitimate government. And once that sense of legitimacy is gone, I think it's only a matter of time. They can't hold on to power. Uh, they don't have enough guns and, and troops to do that. That's my sense. Yes, ma'am. Everybody? Iran. <laughs> Iran. Good. Iran. Yeah. Yeah, did you all hear that question? What, what Will Saudi Arabia take advantage of any chaos or disruption in Iran? Uh, I think not, for a couple of reasons. They, th they th see it in their economic best interests to now be making sure that that gulf between Iran and, and uh, Arabia, that it is a peaceful, um, dependable, and very fluid waterway, meaning that the oil can go out and goods and services can come in. Both Iran and, and Saudi Arabia have that um, as one of their real, true, uh, almost existential interests. And importantly, the number one trading partner of Saudi Arabia is China. <laughs> the number one chi uh, trading partner in, for Iran, China. <laughs> So China is going to play a larger and larger role, but they don't have any interest in um, a division or a conflict or, or worse 
uh, war between those two countries. And the second part of my answer, I think, has to be about Yemen. One of the things that this rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia will lead to, I'm convinced, is that that horror, horrific war in Yemen will finally end. And uh, one of the things we've learned about the Saudi military, even though they've been buying tons and and, and millions and billions of dollars worth of, of uh, materiel and, and, and war-making material um, is that their, ar their army isn't very good. They haven't, in eight years, they haven't been able to subdue the Houthi rebels in, in Yemen. They're just not very good, and everybody around the Gulf knows it. So I think they'll probably keep their troops at home, and, um, yeah, well, I could, uh, there's a lot more to the answer. Quickly, more, more first-time questioners. Don't hold back. Steve, you had one. Everybody? Iranian. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a very good point. There's the, the social media has some real downsides, yeah, uh, but it also is an absolutely um, permeating force when governments try to limit communication, conversation, information. It's, it's like the, the way in the old Soviet Union when people would photocopy clandestinely Solzhenitsyn's novel and pass them around, but this happens on a, just a galactically larger scale than that when the word goes out. Okay, one more question from anybody? Yes, sir. The common interest between China and Iran is that China has been primarily, maybe the chief, um, cracker of the sanctions uh, around Iran. So they've been buying Iranian oil since even before the sanctions regime was put on, and they continue to do so, sometimes through intermediaries. China needs to have a reliable, dependable, affordable source of oil in the same way that we needed it at the end of the Second World War. Uh, so China's real interest is in keeping those spigots open. And now, before you go, two quick benedictions. Everybody, Jin, Jin Jian Azadi. Yeah, don't forget you're Kurdish. And then one that, that you may not remember, a man named Sheikh Yamani was Saudi Arabia's oil minister in the 1970s when the oil embargo happened and we were all sitting in lines to try to buy gas. Do you remember that? Um, it, Sheikh Yamani later in life, after he retired, said this. All in all, I wish we had discovered water instead. And then finally, one last benediction. You've seen her before. This is Leila bint uh, Kanadish al Harsusi. I took this picture in 1981, and I asked her dad, how do you do it? How do you live out here in the desert? This is bleak uh, to, the, to the extreme. And he said, we Bedouin are quick to wonder, slow to judge, and keen to discover. And he said, if you do that, David, you will not just survive, you will thrive. And with that, I leave you, Hearthstone, and thank you so much for having me back.